the same as to flavor, to, to taste. So it's that gusto taste. It's saber, saber, uh, a, a, a wise person is a sabio. But you also, when you... That's really very interesting. Savoir, savoir and savor. Yeah, so, exactly. So that's very... But it also implies that you, when you, when you eat, because the, the volume and whatever, it's you really let your whole mouth, palate, everything, there, I'm going to say the word, enjoy. If not, there's no learning. One side. I mean, trauma on one hand. Okay, alert, alert, right? Because you're now doing one hand, other hand, opposition. Without opposition, at the same time. But let me say, do you know who tells you to enjoy? What instance in the psychic apparatus, according to Freudian? Superego. 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 So even enjoying is not innocent. Yeah. Superego. You, you've seen this in silly American um, um, pre-sitcoms where, it, with a German accent, superego said, you will enjoy this, right? We have ways of making you enjoy. Yes. So, so um, you have to know that the the um, command to enjoy doesn't come from a sweet. Oh, darling, I'd like you to enjoy my my breast. I'm talking about your the baby and so on. Um, um, because as Melanie Klein shows, even the first encounter with the good breast, what becomes the good breast is not, doesn't start out, it's this persecutory object that is um, jamming in your mouth and you have to learn to love the breast and you have to work to love the mother who is, you know, the, the kind of uh, commander of, of this intrusive body part. So um, even the the um, experience of enjoyment hails from an injunction that comes from superego. Superego says, you will, with a German accent, uh, enjoy. But when, when, I, when I, I said, before I said the word, I said, I'm going to say the word, because what I really wanted, I, I knew I was, I was going to get into trouble. It's the tasting, the tasting, the, the right. savoir, the, the the experiencing of, of that, you know. Okay, but there again, um, taste, which, on which all of Kantian aesthetics is based, right? Um, that has um, a difficult history, internalization of food, of what is outside, and what you do with it is also. I mean, the beginning of everything, the beginning of, of the also destruction of the object, right? When you eat an apple, as Hegel famously say, says, you've destroyed it as object. Um, let me just say that taste, remember infantile taste where everything was disgusting? Um, Freud uses spinach as an example in the pre-salad days of spinach, when it was that slimy stuff that we had the other night here. Um, <laughs> children tend to hate spinach. It got dialectized into Popeye the Sailor Man, remember? It became the um, musculating vegetable. It was part of a war propaganda. Um, children hate spinach. I'm just saying generally, unless you were some little pervert and loved it, or I tried to please your parents or something. I don't know what. Did anyone here love spinach as a child? No, you don't have to have your son. <laughs> okay. Of course he did. There should be a distinction also between children and, and uh, I don't know, infants or something. Yes. Because it's amazing that infants eat almost everything. Right. That's, they develop that's right. They distaste. develop this infantile um, kind of distaste. So Freud asks, when did the switch take place? When did you start not only liking spinach, no, tolerating spinach, but asking for it? <laughs> you know, and that's the instance of the superego that actually switches taste on you and makes what was rejectable, rejectable, disgusting, actually good for you. And then liking happens, but all of this is part of a superegoical uh, calculation, so that even taste 
is subject to all sorts of fluctuations and determinations that psychically might be or might not be um, um, maneuverable in ways that we'll still see. So let me just give before our break um, one little mini lesson on authority and then we will start our lesson for today. These were all introductory. I actually wanted to introduce more um, into our, and, but it's I think dense and packed. We'll see how much you can take. So Hannah Arendt and um, Koshev and others, Marcuse, think about authority. And Koshev uh, writes about the phenomenology of authority. And here's an example that I kind of um, update a little, but that will, will bring it across, I think, to you. If someone comes to your office who's an intruder and you want them out, if you panic and call, or even if you don't panic, if you call security and you say, you have, you have to send someone up and get rid of this person, and you have no authority. If you start yelling at the person, if you raise your voice a single decibel, you have no authority. No authority whatsoever. But if you kind of look at the person and maybe raise an eyebrow, and the person slithers out of your office space, the space of, that was intruded upon, then you have authority. So for these thinkers, political philosophers, authority is absolute low phenomenological maintenance. We don't know what it is, but it's not tyrannical, it's not high decibels, it's not the use of force. It's not attached to the use of force. It's somewhere between coercion and persuasion, but it's very silent. Someone who commands authority just kind of shows up. Doesn't have to lay a hand on you, doesn't have to have a police entourage. There's something else going on. It's almost on the level of erratic. So I want us to remember that. That's why, by the way, it's very hard philosophically or phenomenologically to get at, because it's not there. It doesn't show up as a substance. You can't even give it um, predicates or... But it's a relation, isn't it? I mean, when you have this kind of low level of authority, you're relating to the person. In a way, you're not when you're just imposing an order. It, it's part of a relatedness that, however, doesn't um, involve intersubjectivity or anything that would presume to get at an inside. So, so yeah, it's... You right. You don't know the person. There's no... Yeah grasp of so that that's why it's also hard because you can't really assign it a place you know so again location how do you lay, locate authority I, um, the, the roots of author as, as one who persuades or a vendor one who sells a witness mm -hmm. make a sentence it's just interesting she's a poet I, mean, I don't know what the team means what does that add to it Right. So all the, the aspects, uh, I mean, how those three aspects interrelate and uh, uh, shut against each other and create spark. It comes from auctoritas, which means to augment. So someone or something is augmented, is supplemented in a way that pushes something through. We've been, we've been um, well, we've had Zoom and we've, we've been talking a lot about relations of power. And I'm, and I'm trying to wonder what is, what is exactly the relationship between um, a place of power, a place of being able to say, and authority. Because I mean, I know it's not a direct correlation, but there, of course, right. right? So I'm, I'm trying to wonder what is precisely how they... Exactly, exactly. That, that is a good question, and it's really a kind of um, um, 
it's, it's hard to locate. You, you're right to say it has something to do with power, and yet it's not a direct Because it seems to me like you could enter the problem of authority through the idea of power relations. Or vice versa. What yeah. I'm trying to do is enter power or decenter power okay. discourses. By, I, I tend to, as in the telephone book, which is a, a, opens up some dossiers on, on technology, I always go for what looks like a minoritized trace or metonymy, mm -hmm. uh, which is to say, or synecdoche, which is to say a part for a whole, or something that looks kind of harmless, and then moves in certain ways and disrupts what we think we know <coughs> in, the, in the case of the telephone, about technology, about the call, the topos of the call, what it means to call, what it means to arrive or get the right call. I'm, I might talk about that as well <coughs> today still. Before we agree, I just wanted to ha have a jam session, which we just did very nicely. I see you've done a lot of work. You're very astute um, and you're very serious and rigorous. So um, I want to know how to you know, start our engine. Yes. Um, I just wanted to, I don't know if this is a digression, but I just wanted okay. to bring up something. Yesterday at the Bennington's talk, you asked the question, what's at stake for philosophy to take a stand on the topic of death penalty? And I want, <clears throat> and it's about like power and authority and all that. And my question, what is the assumption or expectation of philosophy for it not to look at death penalty? Right. Because the question had some implication that philosophy had it. There's, there's, some, there's dangerous for philosophy to, to take a stand on this power. Um, yeah, this wasn't my um, stance or position. Thank you for the question. Um, because I do want to clarify it. I wanted to um, point out that the only one philosopher, as Bennington showed, ever took a stand. And the rest of philosophy enjoyed silence, which means it lined up behind Kant on this. Um, and that's just not, not simply a contingent, aleatory fact, but what does that mean about philosophy and, and its avoidance strategy with regard to the death penalty or its embrace of the death penalty. And we could, if we could play a game, a very advanced game, and we go around the room we each would represent a philosopher, and you would, in his or her language and rhetoric, say what you think about the death penalty. You know, like, let's say you're Hegel. Do you know what you would say about the death penalty? You might say... I don't know. I was just saying last yeah. night to the, to the critique. I don't you I might don't say it's Hegel. not essential in, in Hegelian language. You know, it's inessential. You might say that. Or the Hegel of law might um, find another way to disarticulate a relation to the death penalty. Um, Heidegger might say, in terms of finitude, um, There's a degradation. I mean, we could, we, first of all, let me just remind us that this would open up a big dossier. I just meant to say yesterday, henceforth, we need to take a stand, but we need to understand why philosophy, historically and traditionally, has refused to pronounce itself on certain issues. Why philosophy says no thanks to certain pressing issues, you know, that that, first of all, that's what this brings to the fore, and how philosophy has lined up behind Kant. Yes? I thought a, a kind of glaring absence um, yesterday, which was quite interesting, was the founding act of one of the founding parts of philosophy being a death penalty that is fully assumed by Socrates. And exactly, exactly. So um, this is something that, um, for Nietzsche, is part of the whole transvaluation of values. Thank you. That's very, 
which is, um, and then thank you for our end, becomes, so the way to wriggle out of this might be actually, that's what it's about. Arendt at one point says, you know, the trauma of, and by the way, Plato invented authority on this case because he lost his mentor to the death penalty. The trauma of Socrates' death is differently circumscribed for every philosopher. For Hannah Arendt, it's, it shows that the polis, or the state, is always hostile to thinking, to philosophers, and at the first opportunity will put the thinker to death. That the state, that's what that taught us. It's a trauma that can, never stops giving. You know, that, um, and we know this in, in terms of different degradations, which is why, by the way, I want to commend you congratulate you for leaving all sorts of obligations and, and spaces that might question what you're doing. It's rare that a thinker or an artist or a cinematographer um, gets away with what he or she does without familial reprimand on some level. Am I wrong? Did, any, did anyone have a free pass to get to this place of of being committed to thinking and writing and, and doing artwork. There's always a social, cultural ban on it. You always, there's no um, valency really. It's the first thing that gets knocked off budgets. <laughs> it's the first thing they ask you, um, the well-intentioned people who love you. Are you crazy? <laughs> How are you going to make money? and so on and so forth. So you're going against all sorts of um, quietly, very often subtly, subliminally launched um, reproaches. Let me just say, if not condemnations. So Socrates' death uh, to Hannah Arendt shows that power is always poised to shoot down the thinker. One wrong move and you're down for the you're out of the game. So thinkers, ever since that putting to death of Socrates, now Kant says a different thing. He says that theoretical thinkers can only shoot blanks because no one gives a shit what they think. It's not like Obama called me, been waiting, um, to ask me, you know, in what way certain things are perniciously Paleonymic, I'll explain that, or phallocentric, or this or that. No power has called me. I have been at my desk waiting for that call to help democracy and, and help soften the edges of pernicious capitalism and so on. But Kant says, even though, so Kant says, so I would have another Kant in the, in the picture. He says, you know, they better make up their minds. On the one hand, we get arrested or censored for what we say or write, whether it's creative or philosophical, once we shoot off our mouths in ways that are considered unfriendly to the power that be, that powers that be. So they should make up their mind. Either shut the fuck up and let us say what we want, because it doesn't matter. You don't listen yeah. to us anyway. Or listen to us, and maybe we won't act out as much as we have to. But our responsibility, says Kant, is to shoot blanks. We don't have power. We don't have ammo. No one cares what we say. But that's why you have to keep on shooting, shooting your mouths, shooting your filmage. Oh, he didn't say that, but he was thinking that already for you. Uh, shooting everything you've got, throwing it up in some way, but with the understanding that we're only shooting blanks. We're not killing, but we're already in the grammar and gesture of the warrior pose. So the state, sorry, the state knows that the foundation is unstable, but we wouldn't fear the thinker. Right. So, but it's still, you know, when a psycho is after you and you want to say, honey, you're just insecure, you know. <laughs> you're right. You're right. You're not wrong. You're absolutely right. But still, now that's one trauma. You're right. I mean, 
founding gesture, very brilliant, very brilliant. I wish I hadn't closed down the shop last night because I would have wanted that to come up. Um, the other traumatic offshoot would be that of Nietzsche, which is, you know, Socrates' disciples offered to, had a getaway car waiting. And he said, no, I don't mind. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so for Nietzsche, this is um, Socrates collapse into Christian uh, suicidal um, disaster that from now on the philosopher will be this pathetic, killable being. Yes. And shoot, shooting blanks um, to <clears throat> once again uh, translate that to German mm -hmm. is way more effective in German than it is in English because in, in English it's just blank, so yeah. it's like nothing, but in German it's Platzpatronen, which means like Actually, it's bullets which explode. They don't do anything, but at least they explode and they make a lot of noise. They plastic, right. you know? Very nice. So shooting plastic one is not that bad either. Right. It's so, a lot of retention. In, in <laughs> New York, one says, you're going to Platz when I tell you this. Yeah. yeah. So Platz is what explodes, but just makes a lot of noise. Yeah. So that's very important, too, and then we'll have a break. I just wanted to throw another uh, contract on the table, thinking of Socrates, is that uh, we're all adults. Uh, there's no children anywhere yes. in this community, pretty much. And uh, uh, Socrates is great prior to the Okay, so I, I, uh, do want to um, and so is Jesus Christ, and uh, God likes his children. So it's not clear, as Malraux and Lyotard have pointed out, that any of us are adults. But, but, but certainly there are but no children the in the world. There's no youth here, for sure. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> are you sure? Are you like sure about that? Yeah, I'm going to cry like a baby. Yeah, I so guess you could say there are no contractual children.